The System Shock franchise has seen some life during the past 11 years after lying dormant for far too long before that. In 2013, people wanting to buy System Shock 2 could finally purchase the game digitally, and actually play it too since it came with a fan patch to help it run on modern hardware. Night Dive Studios also released the System Shock Enhanced Edition in 2015, and just last year they gave us a full-blown System Shock remake. The System Shock 2 Enhanced Edition is supposed to come out in the near future, so I thought I'd go ahead and take a look back at this classic and influential game. Co-developed by both Looking Glass Studios and Irrational Games, System Shock 2 released back in 1999. It managed to live up to and even exceed the high expectations set by its predecessor, and it cemented itself as one part of the holy trinity of immersive sims from that late 90s early 2000s era. Like most other immersive sims, it combines elements from several different genres. RPG, survival horror, first person shooter. Oh, and there's a lot of this too. Items dropped. There's no definitive release date for the enhanced edition yet. I'm interested to see what Night Dive does with it, but for now, you can use some really good mods to enhance the visuals and a community patch that adds a lot of nice tweaks and fixes. You don't really need to play the original System Shock to follow and understand the story, however you will miss out on some details and references. There's a bit of backstory during the opening cutscene, but it's extremely brief. It does give you some history about Shodan though, the evil, powerful, artificial intelligence who is the first game's antagonist and got destroyed by the hacker, aka the player. Oh look, that's her right on the cover. I'm sure she's really gone though and definitely won't show up at all during the game. System Shock 2 takes place 42 years after the events of the first game, in the year 2114, far away from Earth on board a starship called the Von Braun. You play as a soldier who just woke up from cryosleep with a good old fashioned case of amnesia. Right after waking up, a mysterious woman starts talking to you, somehow, and she gives you some less than stellar news. Steady yourself, soldier. This is Dr. Janice Polito of the computer ops staff of the Von Braun. You're on board the starship Von Braun and something's gone very, very wrong. Some kind of force has hijacked this ship. So you grab a wrench and set out to meet up with this Dr. Polito, and it quickly becomes obvious that she wasn't exaggerating at all. This place has gone completely nuts. Dead crew members everywhere, destroyed sections of the ship, mutated lunatics attack you with shotguns and metal pipes, escaped lab monkeys shoot balls of magic at you, and as if that isn't bad enough, the ship's security system is turned against you. So security cameras, alarms, robots, and turrets all join in the fun. Enemies hit hard, turrets fire quickly, and a camera could be around any corner. Combine this with the vague circumstances surrounding the ship's takeover, all of the disturbing imagery, and some fantastically creepy enemy noises, and you've got a very unsettling opening area. But even stronger than the horror elements is the sense of mystery that pervades the ship. What happened here? The harmony is disturbed. Well, these guys definitely won't tell you, they only say weird stuff. But you do start to find out bit by bit through audio logs left behind by the crew. The story atmosphere and environments aren't the only things that pull you in though. System Shock 2 has some really fun and engrossing gameplay. It's not perfect, but its depth is impressive and overall it does a lot of things right. Let's start at the very beginning with the difficulty. Most of the changes you see here are what you would expect. Things like less health, less loot from enemy corpses, enemies spawn more often, but the most significant change is that the cost of upgrades go up with higher difficulties, so you're going to be overall less powerful. A lot of System Shock 2 fans suggest playing on hard or impossible because having more of a challenge fits in nicely with the survival horror aspects of the game. And I agree that this is a fun route to take, but it could be a major pitfall for new players who aren't aware of how unforgiving the upgrade system can be if you distribute skill points inefficiently. Nothing makes you want to turn your computer into an office space printer more than playing through half of an RPG and realizing that you leveled poorly. More on this in a second. Next, there's an optional training level and then you get to character creation. The way you select opening skills is done in a pretty cool way that ties into the game's narrative. You play as a soldier, so it makes perfect sense to start the game by joining a branch of the military. I'm doing my part! You pick a branch that focuses on a specific skill set and then raise a portion of those skills by choosing from a pool of missions, which take place over the course of three in-game years. This gives your character a nice little bit of backstory that makes him feel more like an actual part of the game world. You don't actually play these missions, you just read a short description about what happened, so the selection process is quick and painless. But character creation is also where things can get a little confusing. And even more so once you start collecting cyber modules, the currency you use to purchase upgrades. These are scarce enough throughout the game that it's best to focus on a build that specializes in just a few areas. Even on lower difficulties, spreading your upgrades thin across too many skills can result in a weak build. This is especially true when it comes to weapon skills, because weapons have an upgrade requirement to even use them. 
So if you're not careful, you might end up without access to some of the really powerful weapons during the late stages of the game. There are several different weapon types and a bunch of Psy abilities, which are the game's magic powers. I can totally see how a new player going in blind might be curious enough to try and get access to all of this during a single playthrough, and then end up frustrated when they realize their build is less than optimal. Some of the stats and skills are also just flat out more useful than others. It's basically impossible to imagine playing without hacking. You can use it to shut off security systems, hack turrets to make them attack your enemies, open crates filled with useful items, and it's even required at one point to progress the story. Well, what about some of the other tech skills? Modify is pretty good since it upgrades your weapons, but there are items that can do that too, so if you know where to find them, you don't have to spend as much here. Most weapons degrade with use, so you need to keep their condition up. But why bother investing in a skill that fixes broken weapons when you can invest in maintenance to prevent them from breaking in the first place? In some cases like this, you can use intuition to figure out what's good to raise, but other times it's not so obvious. Endurance seems like a good choice because it increases your health. Ammo is pretty scarce early on, so you might assume that healing items are too. Except no, you find them literally everywhere. So yeah, figuring out which skills to raise can cause some head scratching at first, and if you're going in completely blind, probably some irritating trial and error. But it's worth getting over this hurdle because once you do, the game is a lot of fun. And not having access to a ton of upgrade points doesn't mean that you'll just mindlessly run around doing the same thing over and over. In some cases, it makes you think even harder about how to approach obstacles. For example, you run into security cameras all the time. When they spot you, they set off an alarm that sends enemies running your way. So how should you deal with them? You could shoot it with your pistol, but that would waste valuable ammo. You don't need any upgrades to use your wrench, but that puts you at the biggest risk of being spotted. You could turn around and see if there's a security station to hack somewhere nearby. If not, maybe you could sneak or run by it, but you'll probably have to come back this way later. Or is it worth spending upgrade modules for an energy weapon that you can recharge instead of wasting ammo? Or Psy powers which use Psy points? Having the freedom to engage with the game's systems in a variety of different ways, and then weighing options like this and figuring out efficient strategies to take down common obstacles and enemies, while constantly trying to manage your small grid-based inventory, are very satisfying challenges to overcome. At first, System Shock 2 feels like a survival horror game. You're weak, low on ammo, and every threat is dangerous. But if you use your upgrades wisely and learn to conserve resources for when you really need them, then you can eventually go John Wick and just start blasting your way to objectives which is a lot of fun and the progression feels really rewarding once things start clicking. Here's something else that's really cool. Learning to be efficient isn't just something you do as the player. It's actually an element of the combat system that your character in-game can figure out by researching organs found on dead enemies. You'll need to put at least a point in the research skill or equip an implant, which are useful items that raise stats and skills. And sometimes you'll also need to use some fancy chemicals that you find in storage rooms around the ship. Then boom, you've got a damage bonus against that enemy type, and it'll tell you what kind of weapons and ammo they're weak against, so now you can deal with them more effectively. But no matter what you do, the enemies stay pretty terrifying thanks to a solid combination of design elements. The quality of the models hasn't aged well, but the artwork is creative and strong enough that a lot of them still look creepy and vicious even today. The enemy sounds are what really gets me though. They'll wander around moaning in pain or mumbling dialogue in strange creepy voices. We do not welcome you. Worms make disgusting squishing noises and robots sound like satanic R2-D2. It's like a masterclass in horror sound design and it increases the tension drastically while you explore the ship. Sometimes it sounds a little exaggerated, especially the annelid stuff, but not really in a bad way. Hearing big spiders hiss loudly or these nasty eggs gurgle when they burst open makes these encounters way more intense. Hybrids are one of the most common enemies you'll face, especially early on. They'll beg you to kill them or randomly apologize while trying to murder you. They hold and fire shotguns like only a complete lunatic would. And they're chain smokers, so they're pretty hardcore. But the real star of the show is the cyborg midwife. Along with having such pretty faces, they can kill you in seconds if you're not careful and she'll calmly threaten you in a robotic tone that highlights just how psychotic and unhuman she is. Which becomes even more disturbing when you find out where they really came from. But out of everything you face, I think the most unsettling enemies are the annelid worms, even though they're probably the easiest to deal with. Because they jump. Seriously, what's more terrifying than worms that leap six feet into the air? 
The variety of different enemies is accentuated by the fact that you use different strategies to deal with them, and since they respawn sometimes you're never truly rid of them. During most encounters the enemy AI seems decent enough. They'll react to noises you make and they can be deadly fast and accurate. There are exceptions though. Grenade hybrids would definitely get cut from the Little League softball team, and sometimes an enemy might get stuck in their charging animation. Hey, hey, calm down. There are a few cheese tactics you can use too, like peeking a turret at just the right angle or spamming melee attacks to keep staggering an enemy. Mods can help fix some of this stuff and maybe the enhanced edition will straighten out things like this. These issues are noticeable, but overall I don't think they're a huge deal, and I usually don't have much of a problem looking past them. Even with all its jump scares, foreboding imagery, and creepy enemies, System Shock 2 still encourages you to be very thorough while you explore the ship. You find valuable cyber modules in discrete areas, and a lot of objectives are also hidden away pretty well, so you need to muster the courage to search even the most uninviting locations, which there are a lot of like a mass grave underneath an indoor garden, or this random hole in the wall that's begging you to turn around and pretend like it's not there. It's not just the promise of extra upgrades and items that pulls you along though. The level design does a good job at balancing the unsettling stuff with some really interesting places that show various functions of the ship and its crew, and the story is compelling enough to motivate you to hunt for clues about what's really going on here. Each of the Von Braun's decks are dedicated to specific departments essential to running the ship and you spend a good chunk of the game trying to solve issues that prevent you from going to the next deck, usually because the elevator keeps breaking. This place really needed a stairwell. You spend the early parts of the game in MedSci and Engineering, where you travel through a lot of labs and areas housing important equipment that keeps the ship operational. The cargo bays on Engineering are one of the spookiest places in the game. It's dark and the area is big, with multiple sections that look almost identical to each other. This can make it feel disorientating, and it's easy to get lost if you don't keep checking your map. But what's really unnerving are the massive robots creeping around. These guys are tough and do a lot of damage. Chances are you don't have much extra ammo to deal with them at this point, so you have to try to run or sneak by them. There are also turrets hidden really well in the darkness, monkeys screaming their faces off, and maybe worst of all, these smaller robots who burst out of their crates and suicide bomb you if you get too close. I usually try to finish up and get the hell out of here as fast as possible, but not before smashing a robot with an elevator. Things become outright disturbing once you reach the hydroponics deck, where this is the first thing you see when the elevator door opens. And it only gets worse farther inside. This weird biomass material comes from the strange force that took over the ship, and you start running into it a lot as the game shifts to this grotesque style of horror in some places. It makes me feel like I need a shower. Ugh. A couple decks later you eventually arrive at my favorite place to explore, the recreation deck. While most of the ship shows where the crew worked, recreation shows where they lived, and it illustrates how they spent their time off mostly like normal people would. Mostly. Which makes their fate even more disturbing since they're portrayed in a way that the player can relate to. Rooms dedicated to life and leisure like a shopping mall, casino, movie theater, and basketball court were left abandoned in a chilling fashion that highlights the frantic nature of the crew's demise. They definitely didn't have time to pack their things, wish each other farewell, or casually stroll to an escape route. The takeover was swift, violent, and caused a great deal of panic and confusion. The haunting emptiness of this deck does a better job than anywhere else at evoking the feeling of isolation that's present throughout the game, as you explore the ship alone. Yeah, you do get messages from Dr. Polito for a while, but she's just a distant voice and never right there in the thick of things with you. On a few occasions you catch brief glimpses of other crew members, but these are mostly just tantalizing encounters since you have to watch some threat chase them away and then continue on on your own. There's one last thing I want to touch on about exploring the Von Braun which is pretty important to the overall experience of System Shock 2. I've already mentioned several aspects of the game that are meant to cause dread and unease, but there's also one very effective feature that routinely releases a lot of that tension. The soundtrack. There is some creepy, eerie ambience that fits nicely with all the horror stuff, but there are also other tracks that put a much different mood on things.
this doesn't always mesh well with what's happening in the game, like when you're slowly searching through some areas. And the way it loops can sometimes make it sound a little repetitive, but overall, I love the effect it has. For me, it serves as a reminder that I shouldn't spend the entire time just sneaking around, playing extra careful, and never dipping into my resources. It's totally possible to play too conservatively, and when the fast, upbeat techno comes on, it has a galvanizing effect that motivates me to try out some more daring strategies and treat things a little more lightly. When it comes to System Shock 2's story, most of it unfolds through audio logs, but occasionally you also run into ghosts who reenact previous events that occurred on the ship. Putting something like this in the game doesn't seem like a bad idea, but these encounters are pretty rare, and a lot of them are too cryptic or too brief to really add much to the story. Apparently, the main motivation for having them in the game was the success of Half-Life and its use of scripted events for storytelling, but the limitations of the Dark Engine didn't allow for the developers to do much with them, so this is what we got. Strangely, there is another storytelling device that actually does add a lot to the game, mainly in the way of world building. But unless you're a direct descendant of Sherlock Holmes, it can be pretty easy to miss. I played through the entire game multiple times before I ever thought to pay any attention to it. This tiny little query button at the bottom of your UI tells you about every item you can pick up in the game, even the minor stuff like magazines and potted plants. And a lot of the time, it goes way beyond simple descriptions. You're given info about fictional corporations, laws, historical events, quotes from important people, with some humor and satire sprinkled in too. Use it on a simple soda can and it tells you the history of how soda companies became the world's first two mega corporations, whose names are apparently illegal to publish because of some kind of information ordinance, and how they hired mercenaries to attack each other and destroy bottling plants. Yeah, in System Shock's universe, Coke and Pepsi literally went to war against each other. This is some pretty interesting and pretty hilarious stuff, which adds depth and personality to the game world. So it's kind of frustrating to see it hidden away behind this little question mark that a lot of people probably just ignore. Thankfully, the audio logs are a lot harder to miss since they're scattered all over the place. They successfully paint a pretty grisly portrait of how things spiraled into madness here, and fill you in about what caused the ship's takeover. The events they describe don't always unfold chronologically, and there are usually still a few questions hanging around to keep you curious. However, there is a major reveal at about the halfway point that dumps a lot of answers on you all at once. Pacing-wise, it seemed like a good time to hit you with some major info, because you just fought hard through three decks to get there, so it feels like you really earned the explanation it gives you. And for the most part, it doesn't disappoint. You finally learn the true nature and history of the omnipresent being that attacked the ship, and it's presented in a way that ties in with the events of the previous game. But before this, you're not kept completely in the dark about the attacker. Early on, the game tells you enough about it to thoroughly freak you out while still holding enough back to keep its presence mysterious. You learn about how it got on board, and that it's intelligent enough to hack into and control the ship's AI operating system Xerxes, and that it calls itself The Many. Oh, and it communicates telepathically. The audio effects used for its voice are as creepy and as strange as you could possibly imagine. Babies must sleep. Babies must rest. Wise is the one who does not waken them. Leave this place now, or we will wound you as you have us. The Mini spooks the hell out of me every time I play this game, but System Shock 2 isn't nice enough to make you deal with just one super powerful murderous psychopath. Eventually, someone else decides to pop in who's just as formidable and just as evil as the Mini. Maybe even more so. Gee, I wonder who it could be. These two mega villains aren't directly after you. They're much more concerned with fighting each other, and you're just the unfortunate pawn who's caught in the middle, which is still a terrifying position to be in. There are a couple more things I should add about the audio logs real quick. Most of the voice acting is well done and believable, other than a few that I thought were a little too monotonous, like this lady who just calmly describes her own brutal death. They introduce multiple different subplots, most of which tend to fall into similar categories, like confused crew members talking about strange things they've witnessed on board, or their struggle to survive and escape once they realized what's going on, or some insight into the many's thoughts and motivations from possessed crew members, whose voices sound totally insane. Anybody approaching Sim Unit 3 will feel sorrow. So much sorrow. There's one character in particular that stands out a lot more than the others. The ship's chief of engineering, Delacroix, is definitely the most competent crew member. Her audio logs are usually directly related to the main plot, and they're often insightful and help guide you through some parts of the game. Since she's actually able to resist the many and make some serious moves to try and stop it and warn Earth, she adds some much needed optimism to your mission, at least initially, making her role not just important for the plot, but it also has a small effect on the overall mood of the game. 
and she has a cool French accent. This mission should have been scrapped before it left Earth. Before I wrap things up, I have a few quick thoughts about some of the late game stuff, so if you don't want any spoilers, skip to here. In the game's last two levels, you finally leave the Von Braun. You start by traveling through a security ship connected to the Von Braun, the Rickenbacker. Here, things feel a little more confined, and it's noticeably shorter than the decks you explored previously. The combat sees an uptick in difficulty though, and it's nice to have a place to put some of your hard-earned upgrades to good use. There are a few important story-related moments, like some final details about important characters, and a series of audio logs that fills in some gaps about the crew's first encounters with the many. Most of this stuff has been hinted at already, so it's nothing too shocking, but it does add a sense of closure to a few subplots. Next, it's time to take on the many by going right into the belly of the beast. Literally. This level is called the Body of the Many, where you explore the inside of a giant organism that's wrapped itself around the ship. The dramatic shift to an alien setting reminds me a little bit of Half-Life Zen, and there's even a wonky platforming section here too. It's not a terrible level though, but like the Rickenbacker, it doesn't take long to make it to the end. The audio and visual design is really the best part here, or the worst depending on how you look at it. It's grotesque and vile and constantly reminds you that you're inside of a living creature. Teeth chomp, veins and nerves line the corridors, and your footsteps squish against the fleshy surfaces. It definitely achieves what it's going for, and the art style is so different from the rest of the game that even though it's pretty short, it still stands out a lot in my mind for this alone. I do still wish it had been a little more fleshed out. Get it? Fleshed out? Like, flesh? like on the walls. The first time I ever played System Shock 2, I leveled poorly and didn't manage resources well, but somehow I made it all the way to the final boss fight against Shodan, and she actually gave me some trouble. But you can end this fight in like 10 seconds if you know what you're doing. It's underwhelming to say the least, except it's also kind of satisfying too. Shodan is so confident, so condescending, and so evil that squashing her in seconds like a pathetic insect is really the fate she deserves. Not very believable though. Which brings us to the final interaction with Shodan. You've defeated her and she makes a last ditch effort to avoid annihilation by offering you the chance to join her and rule the universe together. She's lying of course and your character refuses by reciting his only line of dialogue in the entire game. Nah. Besides some minor hidden bits of humor, System Shock 2 keeps a mostly serious tone right up until this point, making the delivery of this last line seem a little off and kinda jarring. The we can rule together exchange is an extremely common cliche that gets used all the time in fiction. Presenting it this way with a silly sounding response makes this version a little more unique, and for better or worse more memorable, and maybe that's what they were going for. If you're disappointed by it, the credits might cheer you up, they're some of the best I've ever seen in a game. Despite having a few faults, System Shock 2 is still a fantastic experience even today. Thanks to an abundance of interesting design choices, a gameplay style that we unfortunately don't get enough of, and a fan base that appreciates it enough to add improvements as the years roll by. It's not hard to see why it's been so influential to games that followed it. Irrational Games went on to develop Bioshock, using part of the title and some of the same features. In 2017, Arcane Studios released one of the best modern immersive sims, Prey, which makes no secret about using System Shock 2 as a frame of reference. With the Enhanced Edition on the horizon and last year's System Shock remake, hopefully interest is high enough to get a System Shock 3 someday. But for now, it's still easy to stay entertained by replaying this older classic.